Well, okay, so time for our second uh, guest lecture today. So this is uh, Knut Dokesson. Uh, he's a professor at electrical engineering in the automation Sy group, right? Yes, so systems and control. There we go. Yeah. So, um, and we'll talk about uh, network control systems. Yeah, a bit at least. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, I wanted to start with some buzzwords that is floating around. Cyber physical systems, maybe you heard of, Industry 4.0 and Industrial Internet of Things. But when you look at what are all these passwords, what are, they, what are the meaning of those? It, it actually boils down to three different things. So there is computation, there is control, and there is communication. The three C's. Um, <coughs> and they work together, so we put in data with sensors, uh, and the sensors are connected to a uh, bus or with some wi wireless network. And then there are decisions taken, so that's the computation part. And then you actually, based on those decisions, you actually execute the control actions in, in a certain way. So that, that's where you have the control part. And then when you have calculated control signals, you send the data back to the actuators. So if we look at the network structure, so it can look like a little bit like this. So you have, you have some plant that you want to control. So it can be a car or a factory or something like that. And then you have a lot of sensors connected to that plant. And you have the actuators. These are the motors, for example. Um, and then you have some network. So this can be one or many different networks. I will come back to that, how it can look like. And then you have the different controllers that is doing the sensing and then they are doing the deciding on the control actions and then they send uh, new control actions to the actuators to change the behavior of the, the plant. Uh, <coughs> if we look specifically at, uh, at vehicles, uh, so it can look a little bit or it can look li like this. So this is uh, an architecture from a research project, but basically all the different vendors, they have their own architecture, but they are pretty much the same. So you have some communication interface here. So you have bringing data, GPS, you can have, uh, this is a DSRC, so it's a communication network between the vehicle and, and the environment, and you have a data network. And then goes down into the vehicle, and then you have different subsystems here. So you have the powertrain control. So the powertrain is typically the engine and the transmission. Uh, then you have the chassis, which is the steering and braking. Uh, then you have body electronic modules. So you have the instrument, doors, lights, climate, etc. And then you have the head units. So like the audio and display, navigation, phone, etc. But you can see here that these subsystems, they are not equally important, right? You have some that are very, very safety critical. So if you look at this, for example, brake, right? Here it's very important that you, if you would like to brake the vehicle, you don't want to be delayed by that you're browsing the web or something like that, right? Um, so, and the same here for the engine control. So, you, typically you, you send very little data here, but it is very, very uh, critical data. And then here you have much, much more data that you send. So, you can send video streams, for example. Uh, and if you look at a typical vehicle, um, <coughs> It means that you have uh, different uh, demands on all of these different systems. First of all, uh, we can say that when it comes to the number of uh, ECUs, so that is basically uh, electronic control units, small computers in the car, so we have uh, at least 100 different ECUs in a modern car. So between 100 and 200 ECUs. There is a trend now that since the ECUs are becoming more and more powerful, you try to reduce the number of ECUs again. Uh, but, but it has been uh, certainly above 100 ECUs in a, in a modern car. 
And if we now look at uh, the bus that is used here, we can see that for the multimedia, there is a bus called the MOST. And if we look at the bandwidth here, we see that on this bus you can send a lot of data. You have 22 megabits per second. Uh, but for the body, chassis and powertrain, you have different versions of something called the CAN bus, which I will come back to later. Uh, but you see that it, the type of, you have much lower bandwidth on, on these, uh, but on the other hand, they are uh, usually very uh, safety critical. Um, <coughs> and we can also see here for this CAN bus, we have uh, ordinary copper cables. It's used to connect the different sensors and ECUs to each other. But for the multimedia, you have optical fiber connections. Um, yeah. Um, so that was for a, a BM, BMW 7 Series. Uh, but if you now go to Volvo trucks, so then we have even more networks. So we can have between 16 and 19 different CAN bus networks inside the, the same vehicle. And on top of that, we have uh, another class of networks called lean networks that are uh, yeah, even less bandwidth and even simpler structure than the CAN networks. And then you have Ethernet and, and Wi-Fi typically as well. But what is interesting here is the number of parameters that you can turn on and off or, or change value on. So on a truck you have about 100,000 different parameters that need to be changed or that you can change. And uh, you have about 22,000 different uh, external signals that can be information from uh, sensors, for example, that you need to deal with. So it's a lot of different parameters, but what do they have in common? Yeah, that is that it's typically very, very small uh, uh, data or small number of bits that you need to send, right? But a lot of different sensors to read. So this is one of the important messages to, to think about when, it, when you're dealing with network, uh, network control systems. Uh, so, uh, of course, you would like to connect these to a, a bus instead of having uh, their own wires between every sensor and every uh, control unit. So, because that will reduce the cost a lot, mainly because you need much less wires. Uh, of course, you will also have increased reliability by having a network bus because you will have fewer contact points. And you have modular solutions that's easy to share information. You can have several different ECUs reading the same in, in, uh, information. But there is, of, uh, there is, of course, also a, a number of different disadvantages with having control networks. And I will talk about latency, which you can think about as delay, and jitter, which is the uh, variation in delay, which makes the closed-loop behavior very complex to analyze. Uh, huh. So, uh, when it comes to, uh, I suppose most of you at least have taken the basic course in control, right? And uh, in, in the basic control course, it looks like this. You have a process that you're going to control, and you have some control algorithm. Uh, and then, basically, the control algorithm is a difference equation that uh, reads the set point values and the outputs from the process. And then it has some algorithm, how to calculate the new control signals. Uh, and then it uses or sends this sequence of control signal to a DA circuit which basically does one thing, it will convert it to an analog value and it will keep it constant until it gets a, a new control signal here. 
Um, yeah, and there are a couple of assumptions uh, that you do during the basic control course. So when you discretize your, if you have designed a continuous controller, it's a differential equation, and you um, transform it into a difference equation, you do that by assuming that the sampling interval is constant. So meaning that every 100 times a second you will read the uh, uh, sensor information and you will calculate new control signals. And you also make some other assumptions, and that is that you are, uh, you have a control algorithm that is infinitely fast, so immediately after it has read the sensor information, it can calculate a new control signal. And uh, that it's, it is alone uh, executing on the processor. So there is no other control processes or other processes executing at the same time. So basically you have the assumption that as soon as you would like to execute, you will be allowed to do so. But how is it in practice? So in practice, you will have many different control tasks sharing the same processor. So what does that mean? Yeah, that means that there could be some other, uh, yeah, you, you assign typically then priorities to the different processes. So you have high priority process and you have low priority process. And uh, if you're now a low priority process, then you have to wait until all other higher priority processes has finished their execution. So they are done with their part. Uh, that means that, that this assumption that you have that you can execute as soon as you, you, you would like to, doesn't really hold. There will be some, or might be some, delay introduced, right? Because some other priority processes are executing when, whenever you would like to do, do it. And the reason for that is that you have only one, or each ECU has one processor, right? And all the different parallel processes, they have to share this process. And they do that by uh, yeah, dividing the time when they can execute. So there is a scheduler that is in, ch in charge of all, all these things. Um, so that's one thing that will affect the performance, but it can also be that you have this control network that we talked about, and then you have several different control units and several different sensors that are sharing this network, right? So if you have a shared network, then you need some form of uh, medium access control, because if you have several different uh, ECUs that would like to send the control signals at the same time, only one of them can send, right? So then, <coughs> if, you're un, if you're not lucky, you might be delayed, right? And that will, will affect the uh, behavior of the closed-loop system. So because there will be a certain delay introduced. And when you think about delays, if you remember your basic control course, so how, how does delay affect the... Uh, um, stability of the closed-loop system. You remember? So a delay uh, will introduce or give a rise to the phase delay. So it will decrease the stability margins. So uh, if you have a stable process that is, or if you have a process that is stable under these assumptions that everything is inf infinitely fast and everything is, you're the only uh, control task that is using the network, then when you suddenly hook it up to the network, it might become unstable, if you're not lucky. So these things you may, must take into account. Uh, and of course you could try to, if you could estimate the delay, and it, it would be the same delay every time, then you can take that into account in your stability analysis. But it's often that you have jitter as well. So the delay will vary from sample to sample. Uh, let's see, do we have something? Uh, there's no pointer here? Yeah. Ah, can 
So this is that this is a problem is very easy to realize. For example, if you start by trying to control an inverted pendulum, right? So now I could, it's so short, so the dynamics is too fast, so I can't balance it. But if it would be longer, I could balance any, this uh, a pendulum like that, right? But uh, if there will be a larger delay between uh, that this pendulum is changing and that I can observe this and I can process and calculate how I should move my finger to balance it. So the larger delay, of course, the more thing can happen in the system until uh, it becomes so large that it can completely yeah, fall down until I, I can try to compensate for it. So delays are really bad. And delays that are different from time to time is even worse because then, then, then uh, it will be much more uh, complex to try to analyze the closed loop system and you have to deal with that. Uh, so this is uh, what it can look like. So on this axis we have time here uh, and this is for one control task and you see at this point the control task is so here it should read the input of the sensors and it will execute its control and then it will uh, output it, its new control signal. Uh, and it's supposed to start here, but due to that there can be other uh, higher pr priority processes that it's executing, it might be that it actually don't, doesn't start until this point. Right? And you see? There could be this, there could be something else going on, and I, I will have a much larger delay here. And a shorter delay here, right? Um, <coughs> so, so there are two important uh, concepts here. So there is the sampling latency and the input-output latency. So the sampling latency is this time between you're ready to execute and that you actually start to execute. And the input output is output latency is the time from when you actually start to execute until your new control signal is is uh, uh, is computed again. Uh, and then you can look at the the jitter here, so sampling jitter. So what is the maximum uh, sampling latency minus the minimum sampling latency? And you can do the same thing for the input-output latency. And then you can see how much it, it varies. And you would like to keep this down, so it's this more as similar as possible. And, of course, for stability reasons, you would like to keep this as low as, as well. Um, and as I mentioned, so, so there are two consequences for why it will look like this. So first is that you have several control tasks executing on the same processor. That's the first part. And the second part is that after you have actually computed the control signal, you have to share the network as well. And then you can have the same delay and jitter caused by the network as well. Hmm? Um, so, uh, if we come back to the engine and engine and transmission control, uh, what are the typical service requirements that we have? Yeah. So we need to have efficient transmission of very, very short uh, uh, or short data. So we, we talk about a few bits or bytes. So I mean, if you have a sensor, it could be just one bit, or it, so it's open or closed or something like that. Or we read a value, so maybe it's a 32-bit value or something like that, so we have four, four bytes. Um, and it's quite often that we have periodic transmission, so there are certain things we, we would like to read periodically. And then the period will depend on what it is. So if we do engine control or brake control, we have very, very short periods. And then we would like to have low latency and small jitter. Uh, but there could also be uh, what is called aperiodic uh, request. For example, that 
if one unit will signal that, okay, now I'm, I have a problem with this sensor. So this is not something that happens all the time, but from, yeah, from time to time. And then we need to squeeze in this data on the very same bus, right? Um, and this will complicate things, because when, if, we, if we only had periodic transmissions, then we could sort of schedule them beforehand, so we know that, okay, now you will send now, and then you will send, and so on. But then we need to feed in this aperiodic request as well. So then that will affect everything else. Uh, and then typically also pass around some less critical data. So for example, uh, you, you would like to log values, uh, configuration data, etc. Et um, yeah, and then you have some, some data you send from one ECU to another, and some other data you send to several different units at the same time. Um, so, uh, I wanted to say a little bit about this uh, specific uh, bus, the controller area network, uh, which is actually used a lot, although it was uh, developed in the mid-80s by Bosch. It's, uh, if you go buy a brand new car, you will have several of these uh, CAN buses. Um, it's also used in, in uh, industrial automation, for example, to connect different machines to each other and, yeah, between sensors and, and uh, uh, PLCs. Um, and in the CAN bus, you use a bus topology. So all the uh, sending and receiving units, they are connected to the same bus. So they will, if you send out the data there, every unit can also listen to the same data. Uh, and exactly like Ethernet, which I suppose you have talked about, or? Not yet. Not yet, okay, so that will come. Uh, uh, since you have a shared bus, um, it means that you can have other units that are trying to send data at the same time as you are trying to send data. Uh, <coughs> and then you have to have a strategy for how to deal with that. So in the Ethernet frame, which is used when you connect your computer to your switch, for example, uh, you will have, uh, or computers to computers, uh, you will, if you try to send data, you will listen if someone else is trying is sending data at the same time. And if, if they are, you will go back and wait for some random time. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but in the CAN bus, you have uh, each unit ha has its own priority instead. So it has a very clever uh, electrical architecture. So it will detect if, 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 if you're observing that someone else is trying to send, uh, there will be some uh, arbitration mecha mechanism, it's called. So it will try to figure out, do I have the highest priority or not? And then it will always be if you are the highest priority, then you will continue to send, and the process with the lower priority will stop sending. Uh, and that is, of course, important in these kind of real-time applications. Because if then the most important things will have the higher priority, and that means the, process or, yeah, the task with the highest priority will always be allowed to send whenever it wants to. And then the others have to wait. Um, um, so that, that's really nice, and it's a bit different from how it's done in, in when you connect normal computers. Um, and it's specialized to, uh, towards to send small messages, and it has a relatively low transfer speed. So there are different versions of the, sta of the standard, but up to one megabit per second. Uh, it also has a, a short uh, bus length of up to 40 meters. Um, so if we look at the Ethernet frame, so Ethernet, as I said, is the, what is used on when you communicate between on your computer. Uh, so then each, so the, each frame that you send has a destination MAC address 
and the source MAC address. So this is the MAC address of your computer. This is uh, to the next unit on the network that you're trying to send to. Uh, so it has some type data here. But here you have the main data field, which is, as you see here, between 46 and 1500 bytes. And then you have some bytes here that is uh, cyclic re redundancy code to detect if there will be some uh, bit flip or there will be some error in the messages. You can detect that and then you can resend the, the message. And here you put all the important data. Um, uh, but as you see, you send a lot of data here which is a little bit different from what we need in these control applications. Um, and we are also having this strategy called CSMA slash CD, Collision Sense Multiple Access with Collision Detection, which is used for medium access. So there is no priorities going on here. So you just have to back off if you're observing that someone else is sending and wait for some random time and then try to send again. And that means that you can be delayed for a very, very long time. And if you, for example, wanted to send the break signal and someone else was trying to send something else at the same time, then, of course, it would be a disaster. So, so we can't use this as it is for uh, control applications. Uh, but still, there has been a lot of interest in trying to use Ethernet for control applications. And of course the advantages is that in Ethernet you have 100 megabit or 1 gigabit or now there are 10 gigabit standards and it's used everywhere so it's relatively low co uh, cost. Uh, but as I mentioned there are disadvantages so we have the no priorities, we have and these no priorities means that there can be both high latency and high jitter, so it's not really suitable for control. Uh, and the minimum size, it was 40 bytes, I think, uh, means that we will, if we're trying to send just four bytes, we're just using 10% of the available, or filling in the 10% of the frame. So we are wasting a lot of the bandwidth on. Uh, by, by using this. So, um, so I think this is 2003, so it's an almost 15 year old standard. So it's called EtherCut. So EtherCut is a standard by Beckhoff. So Beckhoff is one of the main players in the automation field. Um, and they have uh, changed uh, a little bit how you can uh, communicate with Ethernet frames uh, and adapted it so it's, it's more suited for control applications. So I thought it could be sort of interesting to compare how you can change the Ethernet from the normal where you send a lot of data uh, to these, these kind of uh, applications. So in the Ethernet Ethercat standard, uh, you have uh, yeah, some uh, computer here that is hooked up to the master controller. So the master controller here you could have, uh, this could be a PLC for example. And then you have your IO modules. So the IO modules are then directly connected to your sensors. So they are physically wired to your sensors. So temperature sensor, pressure sensor, etc. Or, or motors. And in this setup, you have, you're using the same uh, Ethernet modules. You have the same Ethernet cables. Um, but there is one big difference, and that is that you have point-to-point -point communication here. So you have one cable from the master controller to the first slave I.O., and then you have from the first to second and second to third, right? So they are... Um, so you don't have a switch as you normally have in, in your home network, for example, where you hook up everything. So you have point-to-point -point communication here. Uh, and if you now compare um, 
or yeah, the how, how you what you put in these data field here. So the whole frame is the same. So it's a normal Ethernet frame with the destination mass MAC address, the source MAC address, and the CRC code. But inside the data field, you have different telegrams instead. And basically, a telegram consists of some commands. So it can be to read or write a certain value in a, one of the IO modules. And this is the data that you're reading or writing. So that means that you can send out one such frame and then you can address a lot of different sensors and actuators using only one, one frame. You see the difference? Um, yeah, so EtherCAT is a point-to-point -point protocol one writer and one reader on all the cables. So, since there is only one writer and one reader, there can be no collisions. So there can be no one else that is uh, sending uh, while you're sending. Uh, <coughs> and then what you do is that so if you're now with a slave unit, you listen to this data, you read the internet frame, uh, and then you pass the data to your higher layers, for example, the actual code that would do the reading or writing. Uh, so that's part one. The second part is that you, uh, you, you, so you, have, you have two cables connected. So you're reading from one, and then you send it out exactly the same frame, to the outport, right? To the next slave. And that's this, this, this you can do really, really fast. Uh, so basically, in each slave, you only have a, having 1.35 microsecond delay, right? So this will be a known delay. Uh, and then it goes on like this. And then when the, when it, so it's a full duplex communication, so you have, can read and write uh, on, on different uh, uh, yeah, cables here. Uh, so when it goes back, you fill in all the, uh, if you, for example, had a request to read some, uh, a certain sensor here, you will fill in the value when it goes back. And then it comes back to the master. Okay, so what is the disadvantage with this approach? The main disadvantage is that all the communication has to be initiated from the master. So this is in charge of, so, so this, everything is initiated from here. Compare that to the CAM bus, where you have this arbitration mechanism, so meaning that at a, any point in time, any unit can start to re, or re initiate a reading or a writing of a certain value. But as soon as you do that, then you have, uh, you need to introduce some form of mechanism to, to deal with the situation when you have several different readers and writers at the same time, right? And then you have the cost with the latency and jitter uh, to, in order to do that. And the way around that is to have something like this, where you have, instead you initiate everything from a certain master. So then you can reduce latency and jitter, but also you also have uh, a slightly less flexible structure because not that any part can initiate some, some communication here. Hmm? Okay. Um, yeah, so let's say we have 50 different IO modules. Then if we use standard Ethernet, uh, we need to have 50 different Ethernet, Ethernet frames to address every individual IO module. But with this, we can instead use the telegrams and put them into the same frame. And the big advantage here is that we can, if we have 12,000 digital IOs, we can uh, uh, yeah, get those back in 350 milliseconds, microseconds on a normal 
100 megabit network. So we have low latency, low jitter, uh, but we give up this that you can, any unit can initiate the com uh, communication. So that's the, the main disadvantage of this. Um, so, um, yeah. So both of these uh, two type of networks, they, they have different uh, advantages and disadvantages. So CAN bus is used a lot in the, uh, in the automotive industry. Um, and because of the flexibility, you can have a lot of different uh, uh, yeah, you, you, you don't know, need to know beforehand exactly which e ECUs you will have, so depending on how the car is configured, etc. Uh, and what you typically do then, when you have uh, very hard constraints on the real-time performance, when you, when you have strict demands on the latency and jitter, then what you, you need to introduce a, its own bus. Right? So that's the other way around this problem. Have more buses, and then if you have more buses, then you will have less collisions on the same network. Uh, but there is, of course, an extra cost also with having more, more, bus, uh, more buses. So, uh, so the other way would be to, to try to have something like the, like the Ethercut. Um, so, yeah, but I think that's... Uh, it's important to, to remember this, that if you come, that you have different needs when you, on a normal computer, than what you have in a control system. Because on a normal computer you send web pages and stream video and so on, so it's a lot of data. But, but uh, latency and jitter are not so important as they are in these applications where you have real-time demands. Um, Mm -hmm. And in worst case, if you, if you have too, too large delay, so the, a perfectly fine system can become unstable. Uh, and since you have, today when you have autonomous, or when the autonomous cars are coming, uh, they are really safety critical, these systems. So it's, it's important that you can, that you have very, very good bounds on the latency and jitter here to analyze these systems. Um, I think you also asked for some references, so there are a couple of them at least. Um, uh, but from a control uh, perspective, it is as soon as you have large uh, latency and jitter, it's really hard to do any careful analysis of the, of the uh, stability of the closed loop system or of the behavior in, in general. So you can simulate a lot of different cases and see what, what's happened, but you basically don't have the strong analytical results uh, that you have if you have the known, known latency and no jitter. Hmm? So for safety critical applications, it's really important that you, you can put good bounds on, on these things. Um, and then I, I squeeze this in. <laughs> I'm also the, the head of the System Control and Mechatronics program that we have some people reading here, uh, where we, uh, uh, that you can study if you're in the electrical engineering program. And basically what we do here is that we focus on uh, the control methods. Uh, so we learn how to model systems, uh, how to do the control design, and how to implement systems. And we don't work with any specific applications. You learn that it's the same theory and then Basically, what the models you build are a little bit different depending on what, if you work with a production system or if you're doing the control of a car or truck or if you're dealing with an electric power system. But it's the same principles. It just goes down to math and then it's, you apply optimization. So this is really a field that is uh, expanding very rapidly. Uh, and, and communication is really important here. So this is uh, uh, yeah, one elective course that you can take if you, if you, um, in your elective part of, of, of this program. Uh, uh, so you will soon get will be an invitation for a lunch meeting. <coughs> so it's next week, I believe. It's end of next week. So we will present this. this program, so 
So yeah, this is a master plan. So it's on the 21st. There will soon be some announcement on that. So I welcome you to that if you're interested in this, this master program. It's free food. Sorry? It's free food. Free food, yeah. yeah it's important <laughs> to remember. So it's a lunch meeting and we'll bring you uh, some sandwich and something to drink as well. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes? Uh, I have read that uh, the Ethernet ID and Ethernet Attract is uh, quite uh, promising that Ethernet ID is, is, is better to choose to be applied in between the control to the sensor. Yeah. And the Attract is, is better to be applied in the control to the actual node. And I just want to know this uh, with the introducing of the wireless HART, do you think it will be improved much with the control performance? And then what about the the IIoT <coughs> that will be is is really promising? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I didn't bring that in, but we are we are actually setting up uh, a five G network in our lab. I don't know if you know about that, Eric. No. Or, no? So we're uh, getting. A, we'll have our own. Uh, uh, what to say? Permit from the PTS, <laughs> um, and um, basically what we will do there is that we will uh, look into two different applications. Um, so we will have a, a, a controller in the cloud that is controlling mobile robots. So, and when you control mobile robots, so you're sending control signals to them. Um, it means that you need very low latency. So that's one part of the 5G standard. Uh, and the other part is that we will also try to send to stream video from the, um, for example, to do uh, uh, object recognition. So we'll stream uh, data streams from mobile robots to uh, a computer cloud. Uh, and then you need a very high bandwidth and, of course, low, low jitter as well. Um, so I'm not really sure if that was what you asked. <laughs> Maybe you can. Can you repeat your question again? Uh, 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 I heard that uh, there is an, another, sta another standard, like a wireless mesh ARP. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. So it's uh, introduced by the ISA, International Society of Automation. Okay. You mean wireless part? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, because. Uh, Typically, the, the Ethernet IP and Ethercat is just using a cable. Yeah, With yeah. The flexibility of wireless can maybe uh, put the control sensor and network in separate places. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think that w what I heard from our collaboration with Ericsson is that what they try to market is that if you have, if you're using wireless com uh, communication, the only thing, you, you still need wires to support them with energy, right? Typically. I mean, there, there are some uh, energy harvesting techniques as well, but typically, but, but, it's, but, but uh, there is a high, yeah, but, but uh, providing them with energy, it's just, you just have to <laughs> connect to the plus and minus, right? Uh, 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 and then all the data will be sent over the, the network instead, and, and at least they argue that this will decrease the installation cost, uh, but of course, as with uh, with wireless, you have this. It's a sh you're trying to send over a shared medium, and someone else can can then delay you. So that uh, I think it's a little bit unknown how that will work in the in factories, where you have a lot of electromagnetic fields and and uh, and so on. Um, I don't know. Maybe you are much much more up to date on this. I think one can say that there is uh, wireless. Uh control has been around for some time. Yeah. There's been these uh, specialized uh, networks for mm. these uh, wireless hardware in one, I say 100, I think is another one. And mm. so forth. Uh, I'm not read up on the latest here, but of course there's <coughs> a push from the cellular industry to put in 5G technology mm. and 4G technology in these domains. <coughs> Whether this will succeed or not, I think is still unsure. Mm. Uh, the pros with this is just as well you mm. use Ethernet mm. for control applications is the cost for the basic technology scales with a much bigger market. Mm. Mm. 
right? So the cost would be uh, an advantage for cellular technology. Mm -hmm. But then the question is whether the, the performance is still good enough. Mm -hmm. Because if you tailor make something for a specific task, you can do it better. Mm -hmm. But the cost will also be perhaps prohibitive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say what, which one would win out because you want performance and you want low cost at the same time. Mm -hmm. So whether mm -hmm. the balance is here or here mm -hmm. will decide what, with which technology you can go for. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, this will be, you know, five to ten years, we'll do more obviously, right? But yeah. it's, an, it's an interesting time now mm -hmm. to study. Mm -hmm. So what we will apply to in our lab is to these mobile robots, because there you, you can't really have cables. So then it's a choice between Wi-Fi or 5G or yeah. 4G LTE or... Wireless heart or something yeah. like that, depending yeah. on what you yeah. want. But of course, your, your choice is then probably because it's easier to get a Wi-Fi network. You go to Claus Hulz and you buy one, right? Yeah. Yeah. While uh, if you want a wireless heart, it's much harder to find it yeah. and deploy it, and, you know, things like that. Yeah. So if you could do it with Wi-Fi, you'd be happy. Yeah. 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 So sort of, yeah. Right. Hmm? Um, mm, but as a, so that's that's the application we look at right now. But but you could also that argument would be that it would also lower the installation cost. So I don't know if that's that is true or not. But maybe. <laughs> yeah. Mm, okay. Any other question or? Okay. okay. Thank you. So that's, uh, yes.